Howdy, everyone. Hello. Happy noon or, or 12 hours from midnight in the central time zone. Um, adjust accordingly based on your actual location. I'm David Glazer. And I'm Katie Elton. And we're going to talk about the two midnight rule. Um, but before we even get to the two midnight rule, we've got a couple of other things to talk about. We're going to cover brief briefly the new development on the, I guess you could call the 68% solution. Um, Sounds and very... Um, Terrible and scary. It actually. does. And then also some uh, some settlement options on appeals. Just a handful of announcements. So next month's webinar, which is on October eighth, is going to be about ACOs. And I know Steve Beck is going to be doing it. We're not sure who who will be joining him. I think someone will be joining him. That's October eighth, this same time. Um, you can always put questions in the box. We like questions. We'll certainly try to to get to them. And you just type them in the chat box. Remember, if the sound goes to heck in a handbasket, um, it happens in the noon hour, and we can't control that. Um, it just happens. You can dial in and use the dial-in number that Robert is typing out right now, also in the chat box. And I think that those are our announcements. Am I missing anything? And let us know what topics you want to hear, because we're always looking for topics. So speaking of topics, the, so the new development here is this 68% solution that CMS announced as a mechanism to deal with the giant backlog on appeals. Um, and I'm assuming most people who are on this call care about that. So we're going to just do about two minutes on that. So first, in order to participate in it, you have to be um, a, a hospital or a critical access hospital. You can't be a psych hospital, a, an ERF, which is one of my favorite acronyms, an inpatient rehab uh, facility. You can't be a long-term care hospital, a cancer hospital, or a children's hospital. And honestly, I don't know why they carved those out, but they did. Um, it has to be a Part A claim. You can't do med if Medicare Advantage isn't covered by this. The claim has to have been denied by a CMS entity that is just any part of the alphabet soup, a MAC, ZPIC, or a CERT. And it has to be a date of service that was before October 1st, 2013. And that denial has to be solely for patient status, which, in other words, it should have been outpatient, they're saying, not inpatient. If you have one of those cases and you either have already appealed it or it's still in the window during which you can appeal it, and that was a clarification that in the call yesterday, CMS had a call yesterday and, and they made it clear if, if you're still within the time limit where you can appeal, you have the opportunity now to resolve the claims and get 68% of what CMS would have paid. But you, this is an all or none. Um, the agreement does not say it's all or none, but CMS made it clear in the call they will not agree to the settlement unless you resolve all of your pending claims. So that also means you wouldn't be able to use the other two pilot programs for any of these claims. Right. Which would be the statistical sampling or the settlement conference pilot. You're certain, and Katie's going to talk about those in a second, so you're surrendering your appeal right. Um, another thing to note is you can't bill the beneficiary. I'm going to make this clear. You, any amount you've collected from the beneficiary thus far, you can keep. You, know, you don't have to go make an adjustment to the copay or deductible. But if you haven't collected from the copay, from the beneficiary, you can't do that going forward with the sole exception of if there's a payment plan in place already, you can continue to, con to collect under that, but you can't make any new charges. So th should you do this is a four-star question. Mm -hmm. Here's my one-sentence thought on this. If you appealed willy-nilly saying, I'm going to appeal every denial, whether it's a good one or not, it's worth actually pretty seriously considering this, because if you figure you're not going to win on all of your appeals, you know, a 32% haircut may not be that bad. If you were selective in your appeals, where you're appealing only cases that have a decent shot at winning, a 32% haircut seems like a big deal. I mean, the cost of the appeal isn't that high. CMS is making a big deal about the time value of money and the fact that appeals take two years, but... You've already been waiting for. <laughs> exactly. And, and that's, a 32% is an awfully big time yeah. value of money. So if you've picked your cases carefully, I would not be rushing to do this. That's my take. I don't know, Katie, yours? I think that's fair. It's interesting where they got the 68%. Um, CMS said for a long time that that providers weren't winning these things, and then they got 68%, which is a lot more than 50%. Yeah. Um, so so providers are winning more than CMS had previously admitted. Or at least that's what this offer would suggest. Right. And I have to say, they were virtually begging people on the call to take this deal. Yeah. All right, so Katie, you want to talk about the two pilots quickly yeah, before we dive into the two midnight? Right, there are two, uh, two more pilots out there that are available. Um, the settlement conference pilot is basically 
where you select, uh, you choose to have your claims mediated by an employee of the Office of Medicare Hearings and Appeals, not a judge, and um, it's only Part B appeals, and you, you can't have more than $100,000 extrapolated, and it has to be all for the same item or service. So you can go to the go to the table and try to settle a uh, group of claims that way. The other is a statistical sampling pilot. Um, you can choose to have all of the claims on one item or service deal. Uh, you can ha choose to have Omaha um, take a sample of those and then have the judge uh, conduct a hearing on the sample and then the decision will be extrapolated to your universe. And so that's, I guess, another option that's out there. Um, all that information can be found on the Omaha website. All right, so I think we're ready to dive in to the two midnight rule. Now, I should warn you that when Katie and I have talked a little bit about this, our language got rather salty. <laughs> I, I think our conversations have been R-rated here. Um, uh, we were frustrated at a bunch of stuff, so we'll try to be polite. And we'll try to offer practical tips. So this is an odd webinar, I think, for us, and that we're going to spend a, a bunch of time reading, which feels a little weird. But what we want to do is go through the text and then offer our thoughts and comments about chunks of it. So we're going to be reading more of slides than I would in almost any other presentation. Um, but I'm actually almost thinking of this as a Talmudic discussion about picking apart what the guidance from CMS is. is. So we're going to look at the regulation, and then they put out some, some frequently asked questions. And we're going to try to pick those frequently asked questions apart and I think you'll understand why we were, were swearing a little. So the regulation is, in a weird way, kind of clear. You know, it's basically saying under Part A, if a person is f formally, if formally admitted as an inpatient, pursuant to an order for inpatient admission by a doctor or other qualified practitioner, and Katie will swear about that later, <laughs> in accordance with the subsection. Um, so the physician order has to be present in the medical record and supported by the physician admission and progress notes. So that's really the only place where you see specific types of documentation required by the rule, progress notes. And, and this is interesting because we, we do here have a documentation requirement. I think there may be one other document. There's going to be one other mm -hmm. documentation reference coming up. But for those of you who have heard us do our if it isn't written, it wasn't done spiel, mm -hmm. you know, here's something you need to write. You need to have an order present in the medical record. And it has to be supported by the admission in progress notes. Okay? So, the order must be furnished by a qualified and licensed practitioner who has admitting privileges at the hospital, as permitted by state law, and who's knowledgeable about the patient's hospital course, their plan of care, and their current condition. So, you'll notice that we've switched to using the word practitioner. Um, which suggests it doesn't just have to be a physician. There might be other types of practitioners who can do this. Um, and we're going to explore more exactly what that means. Um, CMS has issued some rather confusing guidance on it. Uh, remember for later that the rule says here, the practitioner may not delegate the decision uh, to order to another individual. So remember that because we're going to come back to that. The rule says they can't delegate. So, uh, so what else does the rule say? All right. So the practitioner may not delegate the decision order to another individual who is not authorized by the state to admit patients or has not been granted admitting privileges ac applicable to that patient by the hospital's medical staff. So that delegation thing is interesting. It's just worth noting is that the physician order has to be furnished at or before the time of inpatient admission. So this means, Katie, obviously, right, we need to have a written order? Well, um you may be able to have a verbal order, which I guess is all orders, or an oral order. And so that's, that we'll, we'll talk more about that, but it does not here say written. doesn't say written. Um, so keep that in the back of your mind. So now this is where the writing gets really crappy, um, because they do the rule through, they start off with a negative. So except is specified in what's coming up, basically. Um, and, and I'm going to actually I'm going to ask Katie to do me a favor here. I want you to make a little dinging noise every time we talk about the physician's reasonable expectation. Okay, so Katie, you just interrupt me when we come across the word reasonable in this rule. Got it. All right. So when a patient enters a hospital for a surgical procedure that's not on the inpatient only list, a diagnostic test or any other treatment, 
and the physician expects to keep the patient in the hospital for only a limited period of time that doesn't cross two midnights, the services are generally inappropriate for inpatient admission. Okay, so this, we're doing it as a negative um, and saying if you're not on the inpatient only list and the doctor doesn't expect you to be in two midnights, you're an outpatient. Then we have the sort of the flip of this. So if it's a surgical procedure, a diagnostic test, and other treatment, they're generally appropriate for inpatient admission and inpatient hospital payment when the physician expects the patient to require a stay that crosses at least two midnights. And I think a key word there is require um, a stay that is two midnights. It's also a notice I haven't dinged yet, David. Yeah, you're, um, not, you're not dinging. I'm not dinging. dinging. Uh, other interesting language here is this word generally, generally appropriate. Um, does that mean that in some cases they might not be appropriate? It's really hard, hard to, to have a rule with generally. Right. So the expectation should be based on complex medical factors, uh, such as patient, or like, uh, are such complex, let's try that again. The expectation of the physician should be based on such complex medical factors as the patient history and comorbidities, the severity of signs and symptoms, current medical needs, and the risk of an adverse event. The factors that lead to a particular clinical expectation must be documented in the medical record in order to be granted consideration. So this is our other documentation requirement. And it's not totally consistent with the first one, which said it had to be, all of that had to be in the progress notes. It seems so. to be broad. It can be someplace else. Um, now, Katie and I have been discussing things like, is the expectation supposed to be patient specific? If I know that 45% of all patients with diagnosis X spend two nights in the hospital. Can I admit a patient? No, you know, it's less than 50%. Uh, would it be okay? Where, what if I knew it was 55%? Is there a magical number? And I mean, I think, Katie, you'd say no. No, I don't think so. I mean, the rule is talking about complex medical factors specific to the patient. Um, but certainly, if your judgment and experience suggests that this particular patient, while others may not have stayed overnight, but this patient does need to stay overnight, then that would be appropriate to admit that patient. Yeah, and I was being unclear to you, because when I said that you would say no, I think what you really were saying is you wouldn't use the test of 40, I think you, you think it's for, irrelevant whether 45% or 55% statistically do it, you do a patient by patient test. Correct. It seems like if someone was looking at the percentages, they might be um, trying to assess the reasonableness which is something we're going to talk about later, but you'll note that, again, reasonableness is not in the rule. So this, the rule seems to be talking about the patient's history. It's very patient-specific, not general um, uh, public health data. So then we have if an unforeseen circumstance arises. I think we're not going to spend too long on this, basically, because it will come, it'll come up a lot later. It may be appropriate um, for them still to be an inpatient. Physician acknowledgement, um, do we want to just go to the next one? Or do you want to? So this is basically the regulation that's, that's always been there that says that you have to have um, a physician acknowledgement that the services that they order are medical, uh, medically necessary. And you're supposed to have that on file when they start. And I think we've often wondered if people have this or not. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. It doesn't come up much in our practice. We but I wonder if people have it. Right. That you basically, every doctor has to sign this acknowledgement. I um, also wonder if you have to have other practitioners who admit sign the acknowledgement. Yeah. It only talks about physicians, so. Okay, so that language is in there. You can read that on your own. All right, so uh, of note in that rule is that um, the physician's order and certification regarding medical necessity. This regulation says that no presumptive weight shall be assigned to the physician's order under 412.3, which is the two midnight rule, or the physician certification. So this, this no presumptive weight language really runs counter to the very first sentence of the Social Security Act, which says basically that the treating physician um, knows best for the patient and gets deference. So this is kind of a not great language, um, but is the treating physician rule is still in the Social Security Act. Yeah, and so there's a question. So the treating physician rule has often been used in an appeal to say that if the doctor thinks you need this, you need it, uh, and it's covered. Um, and it's, it'll be interesting to see if this language undermines some of that argument. Okay, so the two midnight rule references this physician certification um, that you have to have, and the 
the order for the inpatient stay is a part of the certification. Let's talk about first where this comes from. Um, the Social Security Act language, and this is going to be relevant in understanding what's happening with this regulation, the Social Security Act says that basically payment will be made for inpatient hospital services which are furnished over a period of time. Okay, what does that mean? If the physician certifies that such services are required to be given on an inpatient basis. And then basically the rest of the, the language says certification shall be furnished only in such cases and with such frequency and accompanied by such supporting material as may pro be provided by the regulations. So the regulations are going to interpret this certification requirement. In absence of regulation, there isn't one. There isn't one. So currently, 42413, which I'll note is part of the Medicare regulations for certification of inpatient hospital services, and it says it is a condition of payment. So this is the current regulation. Um, for all inpatient services, there must be a certification of which the order that we just talked about is a part, and that certification must say the reasons for the inpatient treatment, the time, the estimated time of hospitalization, Weird, we just talked about that. <laughs> and the plans for post-hospital care, if that's, if that's applicable. And this certification has to be signed by the physician who's responsible for this case prior to discharge. So that's the first time you see signatures coming in um, in terms of, uh, and signatures having to happen before discharge. And I'll ask you this, I mean, how many times have you seen a medical record before the two midnight rule that had an estimated time for hospitalization? I have not seen that. I don't know if people do this, this is the first focus that I've seen CMS really take on this certification piece. Um, and it's a little scary because it says it's a condition of payment. We're supposed to have this. And I think people don't. And so the good news, we always like to have good news, is that uh, the 2015 outpatient prospective payment proposed rule, which we'll know the final rule um, later in November, uh, but, but there's hope because uh, CMS has said in the proposed rule, rule that they're going to change their interpretation of that Social Security Act language we talked about. Um, and I'll just go back. You'll remember it says, payment will be made for services which are furnished over a period of time. So CMS is talking about saying that over a period of time is longer than short stays. And so they're going to, um, they're recognizing that all of that medical necessity language and justification is already going to be in the order because of the two midnight rule. Um, and that really this, this requirement for certification shouldn't apply to short stays because it's just extraneous. Um, and so they're going to remove this reference uh, in the two midnight rule and they're talking about only making the certification applicable to stays that are longer than 20 days or outliers. So going forward, um, this will be a little less of an administrative burden, hopefully, um, if this is adopted, and, and that's just, I think, good news for hospitals. All right, so now we're going to dive into the uh, frequently asked questions that were presented in the CMS guidance on the two midnight rule and that we pulled out of uh, their various, I guess, uh, informal iterations of, of what the two midnight rule is about. All of this language you can get on the CMS website and we posted it right there. I, I will note something. It's, it's tough because there have been, I don't know, four different frequently asked questions and they evolve. And so you have to be a little careful when you do this to make sure you're getting the right one. Yeah, it's, it's not clear on the website which no. is correct. And they change over time and actually the website sometimes will have the whole stream and they generally build, they're kind of cumulative, mm -hmm. but they, they change a little. So just you have to so pay, pay attention, attention to, to the dates that we've listed here so that you know if you're looking at the most recent version. All right, so we're just going to kind of go through here and, and pick apart some of what they're talking about. So this is a question, and this is one of the most important questions out there in my mind, not just for the two midnight rule. This actually goes back to the pre-two midnight rule and all of those appeals. The, the This goes to the 68% solution. Yes. So physician expectation. Will Medicare review contractors base their review of a physician's expectation of medically necessary care surpassing two midnights upon the information available to the admitting physician at the time of admission. In other words, is it prospective based on what the doctor expects or is it based on what happens in the course of the stay? Well, this answer, which I didn't find surprising, but I think should shock a whole bunch of people because 
everyone who's out there pitching the use of uh, Milliman or Interqual to look at, at what happens in the course of a stay um, is, is basically, that, that's all wasteful based on this text. So and it's also shocking yeah. because you've been denied for, um, for reasonable myths and use of screening tools and not based on expectations. Yeah, based on what happened time. during the stay. So here's what they say. Yes, CMS's long-standing guidance has been that Medicare review contractors should evaluate the physician's expectation based on information available to the admitting practitioner at the time of the inpatient admission. So take a moment and think about this. What happens after admission is irrelevant. It does not matter. We don't care what the patient's blood pressure was at midnight when they were in. We don't care what complications happened while they were in. It's what did the doctor think when they made the decision to admit the patient. So is this new guidance? No, says the answer. This remains unchanged, and CMS will provide clear guidance and training to our contractors on this medical review instruction. So we've been saying for years that the short people should not be paying a bunch of money back to Medicare on short stays, because we're not going into it tonight. You can go listen to one of our old webinars, and remember our old ones are up on SlideShare. We picked apart Section 10 of the... Uh, Medicare Claims Processing Manual, um, I think it's the, that, that the right mm, manual, that's right. Uh, where they talk about the definition of an inpatient, and that language was awful. It did suggest it was prospective, not retrospective, and it suggested that if you thought the person was going to spend the night, you're all right. Um, and this confirms that it was expectation, not what happens. So I don't want to belabor this point, but I think that this is contrary to a, a cottage industry that's popped up out there about reviewing what happens during the course of a hospitalization. And it's key to getting money back if you're still in appeal windows. Okay, so screening tools. Again, from CMS guidance. Does the beneficiary's hospital stay need to meet inpatient level utilization review screening criteria to be considered reasonable and necessary for Part A payment? And I think to put that into English, do you need to use Milliman or Interqual or something like that? Right. So, if the beneficiary requires medically necessary hospital care that is expected to span two or more midnights, heard that before, then inpatient admission is generally appropriate. So, pause here to note that we have use of the word generally and, again, and which is also found in the rule. This is a place where I swear, because it's not generally appropriate. Under the rule, it's appropriate. It suggests there are yeah, other situations where it's not, but they haven't told us what those are. Yeah, I mean, if you expect them to be in two nights... It's okay to admit him. I mean, I think that's what the rule says. I don't see an argument that you can attack if... So, okay. Okay. If the physician expects the beneficiary's medically necessary treatment to span less than two midnights, it is, curse, generally appropriate to treat the beneficiary in outpatient status. And no, we haven't seen anything about using screening tools. Yeah. Now, I do see a generally there, which is to me, for example, I would say one, if they're on the inpatient only list, but you thought they were only going to be in two nights. Um, but it wouldn't be, it, it, you would treat them as an inpatient, which is why I think that second generally, to me, makes sense. Makes more sense. First one I don't buy. If the physician is unable to determine at the time the beneficiary presents whether the beneficiary will require two or more midnights of hospital care, the physician may order observation services and reconsider providing an order for inpatient admission at a later point in time. So now, I think this is an important point, which is, if you don't know, you don't get to admit. You know, you, you need to have an expectation they're going to stay two midnights. You can't do it on a, I'm not sure, but I sort of think. If, if, you're, not, if you're not expecting, then you can't do two nights. You can't do an admission. If you're not sure, you're not expecting. Okay. Yeah. So, while utilization review committees may continue to use commercial screening tools to help evaluate the inpatient admission decision, the tools are not binding on the hospital, CMS, or its review contractors. Now, David, why would we want to keep using the screening tools if it, they're not helpful and I in actually, using the test? This one drives me a little bit. I can only think of one value to the tool. And actually, I don't think it works, but it would be if that tool helped you anticipate whether a patient was going to be in the hospital two nights. Now, I have studied Interqual at some length a while ago, but I can't say definitively. I don't think it talks about expected length of stays. I might be wrong on that. Um, I don't know about melamine. If it includes an expected length of stay, then I can see how you might use the tool for the doctor to say, this is what I expect. Short of that, I'm stumped by this. 
So keep going here. In reviewing stays lasting less than two midnights after formal inpatient admission, that is, those stays not receiving presumption of inpatient medical necessity, Medicare review contractors will assess the reasonableness ding, <laughs> of the physician's expectation of the need and duration of care. And actually, let's pause there for a couple of things. So first of all, it's you know, not getting a presumption of inpatient medical necessity. I think if the person expected to be in two nights, it's past presumption. Right. It's medically necessary. You're not presuming it's necessary. Um, but you'll notice that Katie dinged, and that's because reasonableness is suddenly popping up here in the guidance. Reasonableness did not pop up in the regulation. And this is a big shift, and I think this is going to be where a lot of the fighting happens, is reviewers are going to come in and say, yes, your doctor might have expected it, but it wasn't reasonable to expect it. Uh, the regulation doesn't say it has to be reasonable. It talks about it's what the physician expects. Right. So here's our first place that it pops up, and how you, the reasonableness based on the need for and duration of care, um, and it has to be clearly documented. You wonder if the addition of the presumption, the doctor's order will not have presumptive weight, goes to this reasonableness assessment. And, and, uh, and I can, I can, to be fair to serious, I can see why you don't want people to be able to just make up the statement, I expect you to say, really, nearly, I expect the person to be in. So it's not crazy to have some reasonableness thing in there, and yet... But you still have the physician acknowledging on file that what they're ordering is medical, medically nece necessary. And the regulation so, doesn't talk about this, right. so I don't know. That's, we'll see how this plays out. Um, and but I guess what it really gets to is, what's going to be the test for reasonable? That's where I think some of the things we talked about with data, you know, if you could show, do you have to show what the doctor knew? Or what they should have known, because if if it turn and, and if forty percent of the patients stay two nights or more, are you unreasonable? Is it unreasonable? And I would say, I, if the physician thought that this patient was going to spend two nights, I don't care what forty percent are doing, um, because the physician could have thought that they were one of the they were one of the forty percent. Exactly. So I don't know. This is going to be that's where we're going to have fights. So can CMS clarify where the two, benchmark, two midnight benchmark begins for a claim selected for medical review and how it incorporates outpatient time, pre-admission outpatient time? So this one is actually pretty easy. So basically, time the beneficiary spent receiving outpatient services within the hospital counts. That part is easy. Then there's, we're coming up on one hard part. So if they were in for observation or treatments or anything like that, that counts as time. Um, we'll have a question about this in a moment, which is, if you spend a day in observation and then you're admitted, that time you spent in observation doesn't count as outpatient time, it just counts as hospital time towards figuring out whether you spent two midnights. So, and that's kind of what's here. Well, the time the beneficiary spent as a hospital outpatient before they were admitted will not be considered inpatient time. It's considered during the review process of determining whether the two benchmark, two midnight benchmark was met. So. If you are in the hospital in observation for a day, and if at, after one day it's clear you're going to be in for another day, another day, or another midnight, another midnight, you should be admitted, and can be admitted, and you'll have a one, you'll, this is kind of weird, you'll have a one day stay, having been in the hospital for two nights. It's like you get a one day credit for the observation. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I think we can skip through a lot of this, but I, I want to skip up to the, to the green here. Um, CMS notes that this instruction excludes wait times prior to the initiation of care. All right, so you, ha you have to have care underway. Therefore, triaging activities such as vital signs before the initiation of medically necessary services responsive to the beneficiary's clinical presentation must be excluded. Now, this one's given me a little bit of a headache because in my little P non-medical brain, triaging somebody sounds pretty medical to me. Especially I've if you have a nurse doing vitals. It seems like to me that's evaluating the person and that I think of as the beginning of care. Right. Um, and so I don't know how you could say that a triage doesn't count. Now, if after the triage they send you back out to the waiting room, I guess I can maybe kind of start to see that. And clearly that's their position. Their position is if they send you back into the waiting room after the triage, that didn't count. I guess they wouldn't be observing you anymore because observation services are covered. Yeah. So maybe that's the differentiation. So that so their position is the triage doesn't do it. I would say it, to me, it feels like that's care. But um, so but they make it very clear if you're sitting in the ED waiting room at midnight, that doesn't consider it a midnight. 
Um, it's a little weird to me if they brought you back into the room and they had you sitting, waiting in the room for the doctor. Is that different? And they sort of seem to be suggesting yes, although I don't think they're clearly saying yes. And how do you track that? Yeah. I mean, at some point they go into the hands of the caregiver yeah. and... So is it when they're doctor. back in the room? That's the defining thing? Maybe that's past triage. That makes sense. So... All right. Go ahead. Let's talk about transfers. Okay. How should providers calculate the two midnight benchmark when the beneficiary has been transferred from another hospital? So, CMS says the receiving hospital is allowed to take into account the pre-transfer time and care provided to the beneficiary at the initial hospital. So, at, at first glance, this seems good because uh, CMS is giving you more opportunities to reach a decision that, you, that the patient will be there for two midnights. But practically speaking, how often do you know what has happened at the, at the first hospital? I mean, do you really get those details? And you'll, you'll have some of it, but here's the part that it gets a little weird. If you've got, oh, so go ahead, please. So it says any excessive wait times or time spent in the hospital for non-medically necessary services shall be excluded from the physician's admission decision. So first of all, waits, it seems like non-excessive wait times are okay. Yeah. So what's excessive? Um, and again, how do you know how long someone waited at, at, the, other at the other hospital? I mean, that's kind of a weird. Doesn't seem like info they would send with the transfer. All right. So Medicare review contractors may request records from the transferring hospital to support the medical necessity of the services. Um, so, you know, in a way, you're you're basically on the hook for what the other hospital transferred. And the good news is I do think you usually get medical records from the transferring hospital, but you are here ultimately, you know, Medicare can go in and pry into their decision on there. And that's just a little odd. I don't think this is going to be a giant problem because it's mostly temporal. And so the real question is going to be what time did the person get in? And then I, with the weird part being that, that wait time thing, which is I can't figure out. Um, now that initial, the initial hospital should apply the two midnight benchmark based on the expected length of stay of the beneficiary for the hospital within their facility. So if you know you're transferring someone, you don't get to admit them. Um, and that's actually, and, and, and as I read this guidance, the fact that they're going to spend two nights in the other hospital doesn't matter. So if you, if I guess the part of it depends on and if you know you're transferring them, you're not going to get an admission there. If you aren't sure at the beginning, if you think you might keep them, uh, and you that think counts. they might be there two days, then that would count. But if you know that they are, within the next 48 hours, heading out, um, I, I read this guidance as you don't get an admission. So this one, unexpected discharge, which always sounds bad. Um, you know, it sounds like some kind of medical condition. So, if a Part A claim is selected for medical review and it's determined the beneficiary remained for two or, um, or, or midnights, but it was ex uh, but was expected to be discharged before two midnights, absence of delay in the provision of care, such as when a certain test or procedure is not available on the weekend, will this claim be considered appropriate for payment under Medicare Part A? And I think this, we, we mislabeled this one. Something went wrong on this one. This is not an unexpected discharge one. Um, so this is a delay in care one. Um, so CMS's long-standing instruction has been and continues to be that the hospital care that is custodial, rendered for social purposes or reason of convenience, is not required for the diagnosis and treatment of illness or injury. And we want to talk about this one a little because this one has given me fits for years. Um, a little old lady in a rural area, you're worried that if you send her home alone, Something bad's going to happen. You know, she's not, she's, she's dehydrated, and you're afraid she's going to fall over uh, and, nope. and die in her, in her home, and you keep her. Is that covered? And I think a bunch of people would say no, and they would say it is a, quote, social admission. But my answer would be yes, that's medically necessary. You're keeping the person in because you think they need care, and then that is treatment of an illness or injury. It's based on the factors about the patient. Yeah. That's exactly what the rule tells you to do. And so, so I guess in some ways I'm not disagreeing with what's here. I guess it's the question of what is custodial rendered for social purposes or reasons of convenience. Now, if it is literally the person 
is ready to go home, but no one can come pick him up. That's a reason for convenience. You know, I feel all right with that. But I think if you're worried about what happens if that person goes home, I would argue that none of those three exceptions here apply, and I think that's covered. Makes me think of a situation I know a lot of hospitals deal with, which is where they're waiting for maybe law enforcement to come pick someone up or an, a judge's order. Seems like, unfortunately, that would be custodial, um, and CMS isn't willing to pay for that, which obviously is the big issue generally with those types of stays, um, but we're not getting any help from CMS right now. Yeah, so that, that one does feel custodial, yep. I would agree with it you. It does. Not fair. Yeah, but custodial. <laughs> but custodial. Um, so, so CMS expects Medicare review contractors will exclude extensive delays in the provision of medically necessary services. Now, this is another one. So I don't even know what that means. And if they, if, if you wouldn't feel comfortable sending them home without the MRI, and the MRI doesn't come until Monday, um, I don't think that that's a delay. I think that you're waiting for the care. You they know? wouldn't be safe at home because of their condition. They need so, the care. Now, if you're choosing to keep them in so they don't have to come back, that's a little more nuanced. I'm struggling more there if you... You know, that's that's a tougher one. It's convenient. So, all right. So this is, we're now going into, this is an area where Katie has done a lot of work, and she's going to talk about who can make orders. Um, and, and so go for it. All right. So the, the, let's go back to the actual rule. Um, the rule says that the order may be made by a qualified and licensed practitioner who has admitting privileges at the hospital, as permitted by the state, and who is knowledgeable about the patient's hospital course, medical plan of care, and current condition. Okay, so that's all the rule says about this. Three prongs. Acting within the scope of state license, have privileges at the hospital to admit, and knowledgeable about the patient's hospital course, medical plan of care, and current condition. So now we're moving to the guidance on who may make the order. And CMS says that a medical resident, a physician assistant, nurse practitioner, or other non-physician practitioner may act as a proxy for the ordering practitioner, provided they are authorized under state law to admit patients and some other requirements are met. So my first question is, if a medical resident or a nurse practitioner, for example, meets these three prongs, they are acting within their scope of the light state scope of practice, they have privileges of the hospital to admit, and they're knowledgeable about the patient's care, aren't they just the ordering practitioner? Why do they need to be a proxy for the ordering practitioner? So that's unclear to me. And additionally, those people may write the inpatient admission order on behalf of the ordering practitioner if that ordering practitioner approves and accepts responsibility for the admission decision by countersigning the order prior to discharge. So now you have possibly a, a non-physician practitioner or a resident who meets the requirements for ordering practitioner under the rule, but it seems like CMS is saying they have to be a proxy. And if you'll recall when we first talked about the rule, the rule says that the ordering practitioner cannot delegate the decision. So isn't assigning a proxy delegating the decision? This is just driving me crazy. It, it is driving you crazy, I think with good reason, because I, I think that's inconsistent. So I guess, practically speaking, if you have residents, PAs, NPs, or other NPPs who are doing these things, I think there's an argument on the rule that if they meet the three prongs, then you're okay and you don't have this proxy business. But I would tread carefully um, and really look at those requirements. And if, if they're unclear, have, the, have someone countersign the order. And you do, obviously, you know, your bylaws have to allow the admit, you know, there's, right. there's that kind of thing. Uh, but I think Katie's covered that already. So I, I think Katie has spotted here an, an inconsistency in the CMS stuff. So, All right. So the, remember the rule has this language about you have to be, the ordering practitioner has to be knowledgeable about the patient's hospital course. So what is, who, who would be knowledgeable about the patient's hospital course? This is actually somewhat broad. CMS has defined this in the guidance. You know, the admitting physician or whoever's on call for them are assumed to be knowledgeable, um, whether they are or not. Uh, primary covering hospitalist, primary care practitioner or their on-call person, surgeon, someone who's on call for them, anyone in the emergency room who's caring for them, and again, broadly, other practitioners qualified to admit patients. Um, so again, those residents, NPs, PAs um, may be considered knowledgeable as well in some circumstances. 
this is someone who's knowledgeable that is, would not include a utilization review physician. Um, that physician has to be independent and separate. So make sure you're not relying on that person. All right. So what did the order actually have to say after all that discussion we talked about? You know, what's an appropriate order? What are the factors? Well, make sure that you definitely have the word inpatient in your order. I just say inpatient so there's no question about it. Uh, don't leave it up for debate. And this is what CMS says in their preamble to the rule. Um, they're saying don't, you know, don't use uh, location specific references like admit to 7W. Well, maybe that's your inpatient unit, but nobody else knows that. So just be really clear. Don't say things like short stay surgery, even if that's, you know, an inpatient term for you. Just say inpatient. Yeah, and, and this is to me a place where risk man th this is maybe the most important thing to get out of this webinar. Yeah. A little bit of effort in educating doctors here can make life really easy. If they say, I expect this person to require hospitalization for two midnights, I think you're going to have a pretty strong defense. And then ideally it with because, and the because would then include something about them, you know, and it, it, because um, I think it's better to say something about the patient as opposed to something about demographic data. Right. Um, but fill in the blank. I expect them to spend two nights because, and then I think you're in pretty good shape. I think you've hit all the problems of the rule. Um, so it, as soon as you start getting into, if you start to say because most people who do this, that, that I think, then you open yourself up to being sniped at, especially if the data proves to be wrong. I mean, I think that's one of my worries is if you say, 60% of the people need this, and it turns out that it's really only 40, it's going to be easier for someone to attack you. So I would try to make patient-specific statements. And you can use that data in your judgment, but don't include it. All right, must the order be signed? Well, interestingly, the actual two-minute rule doesn't say it has to be signed. Um, the current certification of admission regulation that we talked about that might be changed uh, for 2015, that says that the certification has to be signed, of which the order is a part. Okay, so there's a signature requirement there. Um, when you're talking about uh, oral orders that are documented, they must be later authenticated by the ordering practitioner. In the CMS guidance says that authenticating means signing. So again, CMS cares about signing. And then we have the whole proxy business where you have non-physicians um, you know, who are making the decision or writing up the orders, and the physician there has to sign. So I think the takeaway is it's, the law is unclear as to whether the signature is a condition of payment, but sign it. Yeah, it's, sign it easy. going forward. The, the advice of signing it is easy. The hard question is if it's not signed, what do you what do? You do? do? Um, and we're going to punt for now, I think, on the hard question the, and go with the easy one. Sign them. If you don't, is it a condition of payment? Well, that's a, that's a hard one. All right, so what about verbal orders, or I guess more clearly, oral yeah, orders? Is, that's a of mine from, it's like all, <laughs> all orders, orders are, are verbal, verbal. Have, unless you're, unless you're um, in, playing charades. All right, so uh, this is a situation where the ordering physician calls in. So the guidance for two midnight says that uh, the order may be communicated to staff, who again, who are not acting outside their in the state law scope of practice. Um, the staff, according to the guidance, must document the order at the time it is received. All right, so mm, not sure how much wiggle room you get there. And the order must be authenticated or countersigned. That's, again, where CMS considers authenticate to be signing by the ordering practitioner promptly and prior to discharge. So um, this isn't in the actual rule, but this is CMS guidance on oral orders, so I would try to follow it as closely as possible. What about standing orders? Can you have a standing order? Um, can you have a metric for people who come in? Um, no, you can't have standing orders. Uh, I don't think they've ever been okay, and they're not. Well, I mean, for I'd say that there are certain certain standing orders. I I would say are clearly okay. Sure. Admitting admitting orders, orders, it's not as clear. Right. Um, so CMA says, don't, you know, don't use standing orders. You might use a protocol or an algorithm that's part of a protocol, but it's really up to the ordering practitioner 
Um, I don't know if they're trying to get to the screening tools. No, I would just say, I, would, I think if a physician can expect, I, I think you can expect on a standing basis, actually. So mm. I take issue with a little of what sure. they're saying here, but this is their position. All right, so documentation. What factors should the doctor take into consideration when making the admission decision? And we've beaten some of this into the ground, but um, you know, the physician must assess whether the beneficiary requires hospital services. And this is a phrase I don't feel smart enough to understand. I don't know what it means. I was in a call with a U.S. attorney recently who was like, well, they could have just been in the hotel. And I don't even, I don't know what that means. I don't know what hospital services are um, to distinguish it from, I mean, from a clinic service. What's the difference? It's medical care. Um, and the test is whether you expect that they will be in the, in the hospital. hospital. And so I don't, know, I don't know what hospital services are. You know, that's, I think, my key thing. And the way I read the, the rule, it's temporal. If you need care for more than two nights, you're kind of there now. I have to concede, because a sniff, you know, that's perhaps not fair, because sniff patients are getting care, and, you know, sniff patients aren't in hospital inpatients. But I don't know what it means to say that they require hospital services. Because this, I mean, what about where the MRI isn't there until a day later? Yeah. I mean, they still need to be there. So, but they might not be getting that service until so then. So there is no explanation of what hospital services are, you know, and I don't have an answer for this. So I do know this. It's up to the physician to make the complex medical determination. Um, so that's where I, I think that the physician can help or hurt him or herself a lot with the, in the hospital. I mean, they can they say by what they choose to document. Ah, now this is, should be the easiest question in the world. It is an easy question, but it hasn't prevented all kinds of people from running into problems because we know all sorts of hospitals who have had cases that are on the inpatient only list but that are denied. So Katie, what if the procedure is on the inpatient only list? If it's on the inpatient only list, you don't have to worry about the two midnight rule. You get the inpatient stay. And that's crystal clear. It's even clear. in the rule. Yes. Uh, this should not be difficult. But um, it's, it appears to be. So now that test again, and this, I mean, we're repeating this over and over, but they say it slightly differently. So are there any circumstances outside of the beneficiary's transfer, death, departure against medical advice, or receipt of a Medicare inpatient only procedure that permit a beneficiary to be appropriately admitted as an inpatient for a stay of less than two midnights? Hopefully everyone right now is screaming at the screen and basically mad at us for beating this dead horse and saying, of course, it's what the physician expects. Any time the physician expects, it doesn't matter what happens afterwards. And that's kind of what this says. We start banging our head against the wall again. Yeah, but they say, yes, the regulation specifies the decision to admit should generally be based on the physician's oh, reasonable expectation Ding. of a length of stay spanning two or more midnights. All right. So here's the good part, because it's based on the expectation as opposed to a retroactive determination based on actual length of stay. Unforeseen circumstances that result in a shorter stay may still result in a hospitalization that's appropriately considered inpatient. I'm mostly okay with that, but this is where I start to hit trouble. As enumerated in the final rule, CMS anticipates that most of these situations will arise in the context of death, transfer, or departure against medical advice. Now, I guess part of it comes down to what you mean by most, but why is most? Sometimes people are going to be in less than you expect. Um, it is the expectation. It shouldn't be automatic. So if you view most as 51%, I get maybe, but I don't know where that most is coming from. Um, so here we've got CMS does recognize that on occasion there may be situations in which the beneficiary improves more rapidly. Well, we hope that more than yeah, occasionally. It's, it's going to happen right. sometimes. And I don't, um, the, people are going to parse that language. I don't think it's fair to parse that language that much. Go back to the rule, it's about expectations. Um, what happens afterwards shouldn't really matter. So um, the instances must be clearly documented. The initial expectation of a stay in two or more minutes must have been reasonable. So that's where we're back to the reasonable. Um, Again, it, it suggests that you need to do extra work if this is one of those supposed occasional visits. You have to have extra documentation. Yeah, and I, how do you know that in advance? Right. Because the whole point was you expected him to be in two nights. Um, so, so yeah, a ahead. lot of the denials that came before the two midnight rules were based on uh, the based on the 
MAC or contractor's reasoning that the procedure was elective and scheduled, so therefore um, it wasn't reasonable to pay for an inpatient admission. Uh, CMS is clear that now, um, if the procedure is elective and scheduled, it, it doesn't matter. Use the two-minute rule based on expectation. So what if the surgery is canceled after admission? Well, with, with the same, it doesn't matter. Because remember, what happens after they get in doesn't matter. If you expected them to be in, it's okay. And the fact that the surgery was canceled does not convert an admission to a non-admission. It's, it, it's after the fact irrelevant. Okay, so just an, a quick update on the, the probe and educate process, which is where the contractors are selecting 10 or 25 claims from each hospital in their area and reviewing these uh, status claims and then providing education. So that process has been extended to continue through March of next year. Um, the most recent update we heard was as of this past May, contractors were getting through their first probe reviews. They were starting to provide education. We'd love to hear about how that's going. I've, I've heard some stories. And... Uh, um, and yeah, I, I, for those of you who don't listen to Monitor Monday, we've gone through those a lot. Um, but I haven't heard anything in the last six weeks or something. It's been kind of quiet, so I don't know what's up. So the other update is that RACs are now um, pushing off the date where they'll start reviewing inpatient missions to again through March uh, of next year. And I mean, that's probably also going to be pushed off because of the rack tumult that's going on yeah. with the bids and who's going to get the contracts. Yeah, so those of you who don't know, CGI just won a stay um, in the Court of Claims to not allow CMS to to award the contracts. So that's a big deal. Um, I mean, I don't know. There's a part of me that says you're going to keep getting audited on stuff. I don't know. I mean, it'll just be a little bit less by rack. So we have a few questions here, some of which at least have me stumped. Um, Katie, yeah, to here's one. Do you have any information on the need for a physician to tell the patient what the admission status will be at or before the time of admission? There's something yeah, in the I, back of my mind that says uh, that rings a bell that you're something you're. That I I don't know what that what it is. Certainly not part of the rule it's not that part you of have this. to tell them no. what the status will be. No. So. But I, I there's something and I so I am not sure on this one. There's I, I don't know if it's in the patient bill of rights or anything. I don't know. Um, so I, I we're, we're kind of looking at each other. So I guess the short answer is no, we don't. Um, I'm going to consult with a couple colleagues and see if we're wrong. So occurrence code 72 for the observation time before inpatient, correct? I think that's right. I don't know my occurrence codes as well. Do you know that one? I'm not sure. Not sure. We're getting humbled. <laughs> All right. Uh, what language is used for admitting orders for observation? Would you say place an observation or admit observation? I'm uh, partial to place for myself. I, I think admit admit is ambiguous. It just it just makes people confused, and so I mean it's not wrong. It, if you're going if to you're observation, observation it's, you're not going to you know the ambiguity would work for you if yeah. you're going to argue about it. But, but I but I so I would um, so I don't think it matters a ton. I mean, no. in some ways going to observation is easier. Right. But I would try to um, not use the word admit. Just person that's personal preference though. Yep. Uh, here's a fun one. What will be your legal appeal approach to valid verbal inpatient orders that have not been authenticated or signed prior to discharge? Um, well, I, you, you, you go in, it, you, you're basically saying it doesn't say, you're going to be fighting about whether signature is required or not, and you're going to be pointing to kind of some inconsistency in the rules and whether you need an order or a signed order. Um, and mm -hmm. As Katie alluded to, you know, there's, there's there's 424, which undercuts a little bit of some of this argument, but there's an argument to be made there. And you need to remember that you might be looking at the conditions of participation versus the conditions of payment, and remember that conditions of participation aren't necessarily going to get you into a refund situation. Right. Um, I think we've covered most of our questions here. Um, so, remember October 8th, the next webinar will be about ACOs. Uh, November, we're, we're not sure yet. There are some possibilities. If the 340B pricing stuff comes out before then, we'll probably do that. Um, I doubt the fee schedule will be out that early, although it did come out in Halloween on 19, 19, 1997. I remember that. That was happy Halloween. Oh, I will add one thing. Um, a very helpful listener pointed out that there is, a, there is an exception where CMS has said it will pay for an inpatient stay for mechanical ventilation. Yes. Oh, yeah, we should talk so about that. So that's one... Um, the one scenario they've identified. And, yeah, and I don't think I don't think they've identified another one. They've, but they've recognized that there could be potentials 
uh, and that they're considering them and they invite you to submit situations where you might have a short stay. Um, you know, cause I, and they talk about intensive care and how even if you're going into intensive care, if it's less than two days, they don't really feel compelled to permit that. So, all right, um, we would love to hear more topics. Um, don't forget, you know, our past webinars are up on SlideShare, um, and you're welcome to send those to friends. I'm sure that, you know, what's better than watching a really thrilling SlideShare presentation? May the force be with you. Uh, and once again, sorry.